welcome to the Creative Visionaries podcast. My name is Tori Barker, a digital marketing specialist, business owner, mom, and you guessed it, a creative visionary. This podcast is about inspiring business owners, building connections, sharing success stories, and motivating others. Join me on this journey as we tap into your true potential and unleash your inner visionary. Hey there, podcasters. Are you looking to take your show to the next level? Let me introduce you to Podtask, the innovative platform that simplifies the podcasting process and equips you with the tools you need to succeed. With Podtask, you can say goodbye to the headache of managing multiple tasks and deadlines. This app provides a comprehensive systemization and task management platform that helps you streamline the podcasting process. And it doesn't just stop there. Podtask also offers AI-based marketing tools to give your podcast a competitive edge. As a fellow podcaster, I know from experience how important it is to have a reliable and efficient tool like Podtask to keep you on track. It helped me save so much time in post-production, which allows me to focus on what really matters, creating great content for my listeners. So if you want to take your podcast to the next level, be sure to check out Podtask. As a special offer to my listeners, you can sign up today and get started with their free forever plan by visiting creativevisionariespodcast.com forward slash podtask. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us again on the Creative Visionaries podcast. Today, I am very excited. I have a super special guest, Mark DeGrasse. Mark is the president at Digital Marketer and podcast host of the Digital Marketer podcast. Mark, uh, tell us a little bit more about you. Sure. Uh, Let's see. I've been the president of Digital Marketer for about a year and a half. Uh, Prior to that, I had my own agency for about six years. Uh, Before that, I actually was an executive over at Onnit, which is one of Joe Rogan's companies as basically the content executive. Uh, And then before that, I had a magazine. And before that, I had another executive role. So I kind of alternate executive and business uh every five years is the <laughs> unintentional habit that i made that's uh, your but cycle <laughs> it's my cycle i'm like it wasn't even intentional it just happens but it's all it's all learning and it's all growing so that's that's been my my career so far awesome and so for those of the listeners that don't know can you tell us um about digital marketer Sure. Digital Marketer is a e-learning platform. We specialize in teaching people how to market, uh, which sounds like, oh, there's so many platforms that do that. Uh, what makes Digital Marketer unique is we basically uh, curated uh, 120,000 marketers' content, distilled it down into some key frameworks that we then executed over the last 12 years. Uh, the key one that you usually hear about is the customer value journey, which is the eight-stage process that kind of gives the entire picture of uh, a marketing strategy all in one go. It's been used to help Digital Marketer and Ryan Dice make uh, over $100 million, uh, probably billions of dollars for other companies, uh, but that's kind of kind of where we came from. Actually, it, fun fact is that uh, TNC, the Traffic and Conversion Summit, came before Digital Marketer, and Digital Marketer was actually kind of a byproduct of that event uh is what i learned as as the president uh over time so that's awesome i did not know that yeah it's uh it's a fun fact i think what happened was they they did the events and they would make a product every single event and then they realized like hey if we just had a brand with all the products we could just direct people to one place i'm sure the the process was more complicated than that but that's <laughs> that's how digital marketer came to be and so it's uh yeah i think it's probably one of the oldest uh e-learning companies that you see online that's been consistently active for this amount of time. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a community of, of marketers. And I think, I think we're probably the friendliest community of marketers. There, there's a bunch out there, but I think we're the most, uh, you know, kind of welcoming to all marketing levels, even though we do focus on like intermediate level marketing. Mm-hmm. I think we're very inclusive for anybody who wants to start marketing. Yeah. And like, you know, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but there's different levels that people can, get involved with digital market. There's the lab and then there's, you know, Facebook groups and then there's certified partners. And, you know, I'm lucky enough to be a certified partner with digital marketer. So can you talk a little bit about the stages of how people get involved and like the level um, that they have um, to learn about digital marketer? 
Sure. Yeah. I, you know, with all the levels, we're kind of trying to give a comprehensive view that gives people all the information they need to actually act out marketing strategy. Uh, so it's not just like, Hey, here's how to do a Facebook post, or here's how to generate your first email campaign. We have that stuff too, but it's all part of a, a greater system that actually guides all of our, our levels. So specifically we have your lab membership, which gives you access to uh, all of our courses. Uh, we have our certifications, which cover what we call the T-shaped marketer, which is giving you you know the uh, understanding of uh, 12 different aspects of marketing and then dives into the tactics with with our courses uh, then you have our certified partner program which is basically you know the people who are licensed to execute the frameworks that we teach a digital marketer uh, you know their agencies their uh, marketing consultants and uh, fractional CMOs uh, and then you have our m3 which is the newest one that we just launched uh, earlier this year which is our mastermind and those are uh, kind of, you know, innovators within marketing that uh, come together into a mastermind and kind of pull all their resources, all their tips, all their experience uh, to create new frameworks and new ways of thinking about marketing. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I myself am in the certified partner realm. And so I can absolutely speak to the the networking and the community aspect that you mentioned before. And, you know, when I joined, it was like, you know, looking for the framework and looking for, you um, a community of like-minded people and boy did I find that and some you know some more than I could ever expect and so I love you know what you guys offer and, and the community that you guys bring together and you know the the relationships are almost more valuable than some of the, <laughs> the lessons and the learning that you get from digital marketer I mean obviously wonderful um, you know trainings and education but like I said you know the, the relationships are almost tenfold you know what oh you yeah for that well, that's on purpose, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, we teach marketing and we put on these events and we create these programs, but, you know, we're not active marketers. Like I, I had an agency, so I know how to market, but today I'm not marketing for other businesses other than digital marketers. So we have to rely on the community to develop these new programs because otherwise we're just, you know, I, I hate to compare us to a university, but universities marketing programs are usually run by a, a guy or uh, you know a woman who did marketing 20 years ago or 30 years ago and it's like how is that useful information the tactics yeah. change the platforms change the technology changes weekly sometimes yes. like things will daily. just happen <laughs> yeah daily you'll find out like oh crap facebook doesn't do that anymore like yeah. why would they take that away uh, so it's impossible to say like we have all the answers and so we don't try to do that we try to take all the input from you know hundreds of thousands of marketers and distill it into something that all marketers could use or learn from and then the, you know the frameworks we talk about like the customer value journey it's not like a set in stone like if you don't do it this way you're doing it wrong it's a here's another way to do it we know it works because we did it other people have done it it works but hey, we don't know you, we don't know your industry, we don't know your objectives or your target market or anything else about your business. So take it, use it, change it, customize it. Yeah. You know, that's that's really the point. So, but it's all community-based because we have to rely on the community to stay up to date with the information. Yeah, and the other cool thing about the community is it's not only here in the US, it's global. And so it's oh, really yeah. cool because we get the perspective of people in other countries and like you said, different industries. And, you know, we're all learning at different paces and at different times and different, you know, techniques and we all bring it together. And that's really how this community uh, benefits from each other's because we, we take global, you know, exposure and um, masterful minds of marketing people that, you know, we can all just come together and learn and grow, you know, uh, and help our, our clients along the way. Oh, yeah. Well, especially, you know, with the international community, I think we last time we counted it was like 58 countries or, or something like that. And it's so funny because concepts that are very basic here in America, like the funnel, what's a marketing funnel? Like it's been around forever. And we're like, yeah, everybody knows about funnels. You talk to people, even marketers in other countries, and it's a relatively new concept that hasn't really been propagated that much. And oh. so you're like, oh, but we don't even talk about that because everybody knows it already. But when you go to other, you know, countries, you'll find that, yeah, this is actually a new concept. You know, I talked to, uh, we have another certified partner, uh, Andrew Go, and he's uh, in Singapore. And he's like, no, it's, you know, this is, this is new stuff in a lot of places. And wow. it's like, oh, oh, that's neat. Because <laughs> you, <know, like>, <laughs> you think like, no, everybody knows it. We've saturated the market. And really, 
you know, we've saturated America maybe, but uh, other than that, it's, uh, you know, this, people need strategy and they love guidance. And so there's a worldwide opportunity for everybody. Yeah. And so if, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that you're really um, specialized in is content marketing and yes. content strategy, content creation. So how did you get into the content world? I think it's one of your recent social media posts is like, it's what, like the ugly stepchild of marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I looked that up because I was originally I started typing. I'm like, redhead stepchild of marketing. I'm like, yeah. is that offensive? And so I looked it up and it was the first term. It was, is redhead stepchild offensive? And it said, yes. It's offensive, so I didn't use that. I said black sheep is what I said. Oh, okay, there you go. Sorry. Don't want to quote well, I thought you wrong. about it. I did consider it. I said black sheep of uh, marketing methodology. And and well, just in that regards, I learned that because uh, I developed my company. So I'm in Texas right now because I sold my magazine and the associated e-commerce business to on it. And so that's how I got into that gig. But how I grew it was through a magazine. So I basically found like, hey, you know, when I got into fitness, because I, I was always an athlete, but I wasn't always a fitness person. So I had to learn exercises and workout plans and programming and all these different things. And I was like, man, there's just no central place. There's no standardization of uh, terms like push up could be spelled four different ways and nobody seems to agree on any of the ways. And so I was like, you know what, we'll just start making databases of this information so it's easier for people to find. And, you know, if you're looking for a kettlebell exercise, there's a good chance you're going to need a kettlebell. So, uh, you know, content marketing, you know, has been it's so it's funny because on one side it's been overcomplicated. On the other side, it's been way under complicated like it's been oversimplified yeah. uh but what i found was that if i just had that simple list i just need a list of the exercise here's what you could do with this product here's what you could do with that product here's what you could do with that product then people will buy because they'll find it through looking for useful information and that's and then on top of that my business partner had so many friends in fitness like he was always on the phone i'm like man god you never stop talking to these people like what is this doing for our company and I was like, oh, well, you know what? They all are expertise. They all, have, uh, you know, expertise in different pieces of fitness equipment. Why don't we just tell them to write an article? We'll publish the article. Yeah. We'll tell, you know, share it. We'll get them exposure. Win-win situation. Let's do that. And so that's how the, the magazine concept kind of came about. And then, uh, yeah, so I started actually, actually the first magazine, this is a, a funny story. I didn't know about InDesign. So I designed it on Photoshop, which <laughs> if you're a designer... <laughs> It was a 50 page Photoshop document. Oh, it was so hard. <laughs> uh, but that's how I got more into design because I had always done other stuff. But in terms of just content in general, I actually got into it when I was like a child because I had a VHS recorder. Uh, when I was seven and eight, I used to stay in a recess and, and write stories with my friend, uh, oh my, my friend gosh. Jack. Jack McDonald. Actually, I found a Jack McDonald. I found him on LinkedIn. I'm like, oh, hey, Jack, I'm probably mentioning our story writing at some point. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, he's a doctor now. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, what is he like, an author or anything exciting? <laughs> oh, no. He was a, he was a doctor in uh, the Navy. He was in Guam up until recently. And now he's here in America again and has family. Wow. And it's interesting. Uh, but yeah, I was writing stories when I was a kid. I used to do, use the big VHS recorder to make movies with my friends. And, you know, and this is back way before the internet. And it was just like, you just made movies and showed your buddies and that was it. So yeah, the content stuff goes way back to my whole life pretty much. Uh, and then I got serious about it after, Actually, no, even even in high school and college, I was still doing things related to content, but it really came about and said, OK, I could use these different skills I have to create a magazine and create an associated YouTube channel and build a website and do all these other aspects. Um, you pretty much with the fitness, mag with the e-commerce business. Prior to that, I was actually working work for a uh, uh, education technology company that helps teachers connect with students. And so that was that was a different beast, uh, but still same thing. We used to do expos. So I'd have to create expo materials and yeah, yeah it's all content, content, always <laughs> content and design. <laughs> and, and so you take that, you've taken that kind of skill set and that um, love of content and you've brought that into digital marketer and you've recently created a framework. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So the, the framework is called the content uh, development appraisal framework. Uh, basically, it's a 90 day cycle that allows you to uh, research, 
uh, plan and produce all your content. So it's a three-stage system. And it's the only way I found to kind of, uh, one, produce an ROI for content generation, and then two, incorporate multiple types of media into the content process. Because most of the time when you hear people talk about content, they're specifically talking about SEO and writing. And what I found is that a lot of people don't know how to write. Actually, even some people who do know how to write, it's terrible. So anyway, uh, so well, and video is the most consumed content online. So you got to include that. And then podcasting is, in my opinion, podcasting is the easiest way to generate content. Uh, and so this system incorporates those three pillar pieces of content into one uh, accessible process that rotates on this 90 day cycle so you could constantly be generating concepts content series individual content pieces uh you know support pieces which a lot of people refer to as splintered content or uh repurposed content uh all into one thing that you could then uh create an roi on plus use to create the next batch of content and then keep going with that so i, I it's funny because when i originally came out with the the cert i, I said like you know what content's been over complicated for too long and this is going to simplify it and then somebody called me out online they're like you simplified it by doing a venn diagram with 20 components and i was like <laughs> the steps are simple <laughs> execution is relatively simple the process is this is as simple as i can make it you right. know that's that's what i tell people I'm like i can't make it simpler than this otherwise you're leaving out pieces it's yeah, really your, your your standard content courses or certifications are like all right let's look at your target market let's look at the words they look up all right you have a keyword phrase let's generate an article or let's generate a video and then keep on doing that a hundred times and then they'll start to make money that's your standard content strategy and it's uh, it's it's not a strategy. It, nobody takes content seriously like they do with paid traffic, like they do with SEO, like they do with social media marketing, like they do with email marketing. Those other distribution methods, people are all, oh, let's get into the science and the metrics and the KPIs and blah, blah, blah. blah. And then content is like, oh, yeah, just post some crap on YouTube. Like just yeah. record. And I'm like, there has to be, there's way too, more to it than that. And you can't yeah. expect everybody to use the throw mud at a wall method. Most people can't do enough of it. They'll burn out within like five content pieces, 10 content pieces. Oh, I've been writing articles for two months and I haven't made any money off of it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, because to date, there hasn't been a system for really figuring it out. It's just been a do crap and pray, you know, that's, <laughs> yeah, it's, oh, well, it might work. Like, ah, yeah. there's a solid chance that'll do absolutely nothing for you because you didn't you didn't think about it at all yeah. you just started doing stuff well and, and but even no, i was ahead. just gonna say it, it's it's funny because content is like the basis of marketing right you need content in order to do marketing so it's like why has this been overlooked or why has it you know like been pushed to the side because it's so important when it comes to oh, you know i'll tell you everything I'll tell you exactly why, because people mix the method. They say, oh, you need content for email. So it's really email marketing. Oh, you need content for social media posts. Oh, so it's for social media marketing. Oh, you need content so you could rank on Google. Okay, so it's for SEO marketing. So really what happens most of the time is people mush distribution with production and mm -hmm. you shouldn't do that. Because the problem is when you do that, you're really just thinking about the way you're sharing information rather than the information itself. And the information itself should be generated on selling things and making money, <laughs> you know, because the because that's what we all do. That's what businesses do. You make money. And somehow the content process gets completely disconnected from making money. Instead, it just becomes we got to be active on social. Oh, we have to have a newsletter. We have to blah, blah, blah. So instead, what you need to think of is, okay, I'm going to produce content. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a lot of money. What should I write about? It's like, wow, well, you should write about the thing that makes your company the most money and make some more money. You know, it's so simple, but th that just goes out the window when people get into content creation. They just go straight to, well, this is a viral post. And so I'm going to look at the viral post and figure out why they did it and blah, blah, instead of like, no, you sell, I, I think in the, the survey, I said you sell white sneakers. Yeah. So 
why don't you just think about white sneakers? Because that's the thing that everybody wants. Why do people like the white sneakers? Like, oh, well, they're really good for skateboarding. Okay, well, let's talk about skateboarding. Maybe there's five types of shoe that are best for skateboarding. And guess what? Yours is number one. Yeah. You know, maybe you want white shoes while you're skateboarding because the shoe will eventually rub against the top of the skateboard and it'll cause a mark on the side of it. And these ones have a special panel where it won't wear out your shoe because it scrapes against the panel. So it's specifically for this one thing I yeah. skateboarded. So that's why I'm like, it, it was an issue with <laughs> good analogy. Good analogy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's, uh, but people just go with the ether, like, you know, or they just make crap up. And yeah. so it's uh there's a reason why and it's complicated it's really complicated because then you have to think of like what methodology should you use and instead of thinking well everybody makes video content and so people default to video content but maybe you hate being on camera or maybe you hate the editing process which is pretty involved and complicated or whatever and maybe you're a writer so you should write content and even if your target market is somebody who doesn't like writing content you're a content writer and there is a significant population who does like brand content. So you should do that. You should really just do whatever content type you will do. You know, it's, yeah. that's what matters. Cause unless you do all this stuff for a while, then it's kind of pointless because I can make the most amazing infographic on the planet. But if I'm not known for infographic information, then that's just a little thing I did one time and who cares? It's like when people say they, you know, I went skydiving once. It's like, oh, that's neat. They can't tell you anything about skydiving because they only done it once. It was a neat thing, but nobody's going to go to them for their next skydiving lesson. Yeah, I'm right? not. <laughs> <laughs> that was neat. Moving on with my life, you know. I did the same now thing with I'm marathon. An expert. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, I, I ran a marathon earlier this year, and it's like. I can't tell you much about running marathons other than I did it one time and, you know, yeah. I didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> Those are good goals. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just a checklist. And don't die. Yes. Right. Yeah. But that's totally different. That's like a personal development, a mm -hmm. uh, bucket list, like all these different things, but I'm not doing it because I expect to one day win the marathon or one day, I don't know, run a marathon or I don't know what you would do with that. I just did it for me. It was very selfish yeah. quest for self-development and that was the end of the story. So <laughs> I'm not gonna make a bunch of content about it. <laughs> As a podcaster, you know that creating great content is only half the battle. That's where Remarker comes in. Remarker is a podcast branding, production and marketing solution. Whether you're a seasoned podcaster or just starting out, Remarker will help you grow your show and build your authority. So why wait? Head to creativevisionariespodcast.com slash remarker, that's R-E-M-A-R-K-R, -E where you can book a demo and discover how Remarker's full service approach can benefit you and your podcast. So where do you see people starting out in their content journey? What platform do they usually start? Is it uh, like writing blog articles or is it infographics? What type of content do people usually kind of start and dabble in? Uh, it, it just depends. I mean, most do nothing is the answer. <laughs> most default to absolutely nothing. Hire a millennial and they'll do your, con your content for you. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, most of the time, I mean, most companies like realistically, they start with an FAQ section on the website or they start with a manual for their product. So the content isn't for entertainment purposes. It's not for marketing. It is for specific use of a type of product, which is good. You want, yeah. you need to answer those questions. Very functional. Uh, that's where people start. And that's where everybody should start. You know, if you have 20 products, then you should answer five FAQs on each product. You have a hundred pieces of content. That was easy. <laughs> You know, that's that's where you should start. Make useful stuff, especially for justifying it. If you're, say, a content marketer and you're trying to justify your existence in a company that doesn't appreciate content, uh, then you say, well, let's make this operational. If we make content FAQs for each one of your products, now we may have decreased the workload on your customer service department because now you have a bunch of answers online and people look for those prior to calling us. So now there's a operational benefit to creating content. Uh, so that's where most companies start, you know. And then the next place they go is social media. What do I, what do I post on social media? You know, it's like, okay, well, we have to post something. You can't just post buy my crap all the time. <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. So what do we do? It's like, oh, okay, well, let's talk about, you know, going back to the tennis shoe thing. Like, Hey, here's cool guy doing a jump on a skateboard. Yeah. 
that's neat. There you go. That's content. And a lot of people confuse content with like, it doesn't all have to be pillar content. Pillar content for us is long form content. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like an article, it's a, you know, 1000 to 5,000 word article video. It's a 10 minute plus video podcasts. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, 20 to 60 minute podcasts. Like those are pillar pieces of content. Your derivative content comes from those because then you can do quotes, stats mm -hmm. mentioned within the graphic. If you have a guest on a podcast, you could do a bio on that guest. Uh, you know, other quotes within the information, headlines within the articles, so on and so forth. And that's your support, repurposed, splintered content. Uh, and then you're good to go. So really you could start with just, like if I, if somebody said like, how do I get going? I would say, pick your pillar. So is your pillar gonna be a article? Is it gonna be a video or is it gonna be a podcast? Do one a week for three months and then, and only one. Don't Don't pick, oh, I'm gonna rotate pillars because then you're you're getting into way more too much production without justifying it through experience so just right. pick one do it three months ideally a year but nobody has a year um and then then look at how it went how it went because what you'll find is some people say like oh i'm gonna write i'm a writer and you'll be like well how long does it take you to write an article and they're like oh well you know 40 hours and it's like okay well you don't have 40 hours <laughs> The other mistake that people make is thinking that they can identify a good piece of content. Mm. And really that's, it's just ego is what it is. Cause you're like, well, I know what people want. And it's like, no, you don't, you know, I especially don't just from my personality type and how I've, you know, developed, I don't know that at all. I will be completely wrong. If I try to pick out of a set of 30 pieces of content, which is going to be the winner, I'll be wrong most of the time. Yeah. Like, 90% of the time. Uh, so what you have to do is you just have to do a lot of it and then use that feedback loop to make better content. And then you, I, I specifically, the function for fixing this problem is, is what I call a content series, where instead of being like, I'm going to create a random bunch of content, I'm going to create a series, just like you see on like a Netflix right. eight run show. You know, if the eight run show or eight episode show goes great, then great. They'll do the next season. Otherwise kill that thing, move on. There you go. Or even just a bad episode, like pilots with, uh, you know, sitcoms. Like if the, if the pilot's bad, sorry, you know, you're done. Uh, then you stop and you move on. So, but with the content series, you can at least get some solid feedback and it'll tell people that I'm not just making a piece of content. I'm making a bunch of content. So if you find my content, you like this piece, there's other pieces that you can enjoy. And a lot of people skip that. They're like, well, let's try one article, see if it works. Okay, now I'm going to write this article and see if it works. And then I'm going to write this article and see if it works. It's like, how do you get feedback from that? How do you get metrics or, or you right. know, intelligent, measurables. yeah, measurables where you can say like, mm -hmm. okay, this topic went well because they stayed on the page for four minutes where our average post, they only stay on the page for two minutes. So this is obviously engaging content. Why is it engaging there you go. Now, on top of the fact that just within that article that you put on your website, you now have a list of articles that are associated in the same topic with that topic. So now you keep people on the website longer, clicking more links, seeing more ads, and then now you can have a newsletter subscriber or a fan or whatever, or customer. Customer, yeah. I should start with customer. Right? Yeah. You make money from the content. <laughs> right. And what I love about that approach is that not only like, let's pick something, you know, pick one thing and let's do it for like three months. You, you generate content, but it also helps to build the commitment aspect of it, right? Because there's commitment that comes with having to generate content for marketing because anyone can do it, you know, here and there or whatever. But if you create a strategy and create a plan and then actually stick to it and implement it, then you're more likely to see success versus like every once in a while, I'm going to do this. If you have a clear mm -hmm. picture and a clear pl plan, um, your end result is going to be uh, more received and better results oh, yeah. and measurable than anything else for sure. Exactly. And that that's called creating a destination. You know, because if you don't have, if people don't know what they're going to get, they're not going to come back. It's, you know, the McDonald's model. Like I could go to any McDonald's in the country. I know exactly what the hamburger is going to be like. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the point. So they, that's really the effect. But, but I know that I could go into any, that's why people go to Starbucks, not Starbucks has the best coffee. It's that I know what the mm -hmm. service is going to be like. I know what I'm going to order. I know that it's going to be relatively the same. 
you know, right. wherever you go. So there's an expectation. And now I'm a longtime customer. You know, you can't say that about, you know, someplace else that's like, oh, I went there once and it was pretty good. And then I tried to go back, but I wasn't in the area. So I went to this other place and they didn't have anything similar. So now I'm completely disconnected from my original experience. And why would I go back to this other place if everybody, it wasn't good enough for me to even go back, you know, because right. a, a lot of people think that the the best product in the world is going to win, the best brand in the world is going to win. And it's not that at all. It's just the people who do everything consistently and that people can trust to keep on doing that thing consistently. And now, even though Starbucks coffee isn't the best, I'm still gonna go back there because it's better than going to Joe's that I've never even seen before in a place I've never been and being like, I hope I hope this coffee's good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm spending really time and money on it. <laughs> I need yeah, it to be good. <laughs> and well, and that's that's why it's like everybody always like bashes the big corporations and the big franchises and chains, but it's like people go there because they don't want to waste the energy doing something that they might not be satisfied from. Yeah. Right. Because it's that's why, you know, well, that's why in Austin, they block a lot of the change. They don't block them. Changes just don't succeed because people have an expectation in Austin <clears throat> that they could go to any place on Congress and any restaurant Congress is going to be unique. It's going to be high quality and it's going to be different. And that's what we like here. And so mm -hmm. the culture trains people to do that. But for the most part, your, your average person going to your average day is going to default to the thing that they could trust for the amount of money they're willing to spend and the amount of time that they have to consume it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's for sure. Uh, consistency, people like predictability in that, in that sense. <laughs> it's safe. Yeah. You know, you don't want to stress out about that every single day. That's tiring. So we've talked about marketing, we've talked about content. Let's talk a little bit about leadership because I think leadership is a huge um, aspect in any business and in any role that I think may sometimes be overlooked. And so I wanted to kind of get your insight because I know that you you like to to talk about the the role of leadership in a business. And um, so I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Oh, yeah. Leadership is, I mean, because I always talk about how marketing changes all the time, but leadership in terms of like my last executive role to this executive role, completely different. Everything has changed. Hiring has changed. Management has changed. Firing has changed. Like every aspect of just being a manager has gotten different. I'm not going to say harder because there are some aspects where I'm like, okay, that's a little bit easier, I guess. People are being more upfront with their feelings and how, what their expectations of the job, which is good. Uh, but for the most part, like the entire environment has been flipped because I, I went to school for management. And so back then it was, you know, you got to listen to your employees, you got to incorporate their input. You have to, you know, there was a list of kind of principles that you live by in order to manage effectively. Problem is I did all that stuff and it, it's, it's different now. It's, it, doesn't apply a lot of places. Like there's so many more jobs available. And then there's this feeling of, because the, the feeling for millennials, like when I grew up was, you know, find your passion, live your passion, you know, but it was still work hard, you know, yeah. it's still like, Hey, put in the effort, get the experience. Like don't have high expectations of something that you've never done before, because why would you know anything? It's a little bit different now because I think people, uh have very high expectations and they have very good self-esteem is probably what the best term for it where they have expectations of the company like you can't tell me what to do or i'm gonna do it my way and you're like there's a reason there's a reason we made it like this like this is from a decade of work this process was created and you're questioning it and you've been here for a week well what <laughs> disruption <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, well, the, the problem is like i was trained to use disruption but i was trained to you know do the job first understand how everything works and then disruption there was a process to it now it's just True. like we're going to start the disruption immediately <laughs> they've got it backwards <laughs> <laughs> how would that work you don't even get what i'm trying to say it's it's and it's not everybody of course you, you have good people but the the general feeling i've had is that the expectations are very high uh reward systems have to be very high uh understanding about uh, time off has to be very high 
uh, there's just a list of things that are really obligations for the company that don't translate all the time into productivity, but they're still, you still have to do them these days because that's the expectation of what you're going to do. Whereas before it'd be like, do this job this way or you're fired. That was the process. <laughs> it's like, yes. okay, eventually when you learn and you can contribute enough, then you could be the person who creates the process and so on and so forth. Uh, but, you know, it might just reflect the times because everything has changed in terms of the work environment has changed. Uh, the number of employees you need has changed. And you can see that with a lot of corporations these days firing everybody. Ah, half the staff. Boop. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. what? That's a big deal. And now it's being looked at as a huge benefit for companies. And I think it's just because uh, the old models are dead, having incorporated new technology, having incorporated new, uh, you know, management processes, tracking systems, mm -hmm. like all the tech we have now is brand new. It's nothing you could have learned. You know, I graduated college in 2005. Yeah. So my my knowledge is technically, you know, 20 years out of date, not 20 years, but almost 20 years out of date. Right. right. And so it, it's a totally different thing. And even now, I don't think colleges teach like that because they're still at the philosophy level, which that's probably changing. Uh, but it, leadership as a whole has changed a lot. And, and even longstanding institutions like the military, you know, the military mm -hmm. has been adjusting their practices a lot to, and, and it's, and I, it sounds like I'm saying, oh, it's, it's different or it's worse now. It's really not because it's still incorporating the feelings, incorporating the long-term objectives of your employees, the, you know, their passions and their interests and using their innovation to change. That's all good stuff. It's just different because you used to be able to yell your way through the system, <laughs> through, through to productivity. And you can't do that anymore. It's just, it's not going to happen. So uh, leadership now is, uh, I, I'd say much more emotionally based than it used to be which isn't a bad thing, but it, it definitely takes a different mindset to, uh, you know, away from the purely logical side or the purely profitability side. Now you have this emotional component and it's good. It, it has to happen and people hopefully will be happier. I'm not sure about the happiness statistics, but you know, maybe. Is, is happiness <laughs> measurable? I don't know. <laughs> nah, it is for me. I know when I'm happy or unhappy. So, you know, and, and I think people, I, I think it's, it's good. People should know, like, this isn't making me happy. The only, the only drawback that I see to it is that since there's so many jobs available that people are able to leave rather than suffering the pain of development. And if development's painful. It's not something pleasant, you know? I was in fitness. You don't get fitness results by being lazy and not sweating. That would be great. I would love that. I would, sign me up for the pill that has no side effects that will keep me in shape and healthy. I will do that, yep. but that doesn't exist. So instead I have to go sweat sometimes and I have to recover and I have to do all these unpleasant things. But at the end, I know that I'm healthier and it's beneficial right. in the long run. So I, I'd say, you know, the only thing that the only drawback I could see from constantly reflecting on how happy is my job making me is that there's long-term happiness. After you become that expert, after you have developed enough, this will be fun. Something that you thought was just the most horrendous, stressful thing in the world, like speaking publicly. A lot mm. of people hate that. And then they get into a position where they have to do it, And you're like, you know what? This is okay. I'm good at this. And now I feel okay about this. But if you had quit two years ago when you started, then no, it's still unpleasant because you didn't do anything to develop that. Yeah. There's a, a quote that you just reminded me of. It's called don't quit or it says don't quit before the magic happens. And so it's yeah. like just getting through that, you know, stage of development and learning to get to the other side of, you know, the magic. <laughs> yeah. Or finding stuff you'll be good at. You know, when I was, uh, you know, going back to sports again, and I was an athlete. Uh, <laughs> I, I played water polo and I'd never played water polo before my freshman year of high school. And water polo is a pretty intense sport. So was, there's a good expectation, even though I was a swimmer, that I wouldn't be good at water polo. But yay, my coach saw me in the goal as a goalie. And he's like, you're a goalie now. And they put me in the next varsity game. And then we won CIF the next year. And I was a goalie. Uh, but that was, if I hadn't taken that step of like, here's a sport I've never played before. That's super difficult, but I'm going to try it and I'll do my best. I never would have discovered that. I would yeah. have played something else and probably been fine, but 
No, I learned, oh my gosh, I'm really good at this. So I think by not going through that pain process or that discomfort process, people, one, might be missing something that they're really good at that they never considered. And two, miss the opportunity to get better at something that you just might enjoy. Because there's plenty of stuff that we do that we enjoy that isn't beneficial in any other way other than providing you with enjoyment. If you don't try a bunch of stuff, you're never going to learn what those things are. Yeah. And, and especially after you develop them, because once you develop them, you're like, oh man painting is awesome like i hate watercoloring like watercolor paint it just frustrates me but maybe if i spent a year trying to do be good at watercolor painting i yeah, maybe maybe i would enjoy it you know just don't know you so the, always... the point of all that is get a job do work for a while and yeah. then hate it <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then decide if you hate it or not and then decide if you hate it. don't start <laughs> hating it that's you're not gonna get anything out of it <laughs> Well, let's, um, let's wrap this up. And I want you to give one piece of advice that you can leave the audience with what, whether that is leadership wise, content marketing, um, anything that you want to share a uh, piece of advice for people. Okay. Uh, one piece. Oh, that's tricky. I'm going to say this. Uh, if you want to get into content marketing, start being very deliberate about how you react to content. Mm. Because if you don't, a lot of people just scroll and they click on stuff and they comment on some stuff and they like some stuff and they never really think about why they're liking these things or why they looked at this piece and not that piece. But if you could turn your all of your social media watching and scrolling, which for most people is probably between an hour and six hours a day at least. If you're doing it mindlessly all the time, you will get very little out of it. But yeah. if you could take that extra step of thinking about what's happening, why are you consuming this? You'll learn a ton about yourself. You'll learn how to create content and you'll learn what type of content you should be creating. Mm. There you go. That okay. and take the content certification at digitalmarketer.com because I taught it and it took 20 years for me to develop this process. So I'd appreciate the feedback and and it might work for you i've had people it, it works absolutely i think you know that's next on my list i've got to get through you know that certification so that i can you know knock it out of the park when it comes to content <laughs> all right there you go well if you do nothing else do content series stop thinking in terms of individual pieces start thinking in terms of at least three to seven pieces mm. and then that'll change content for you forever like it's the it's not the easiest thing but it's pretty easy to do rather than randomly doing content crap yeah yeah absolutely well mark thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge and and it's been a pleasure talking to you where's the best place people can uh connect with you uh me personally if you go to markdegrass.com uh degrass is spelled d-e-g-r-a-s-s-e -S -S -E, uh you could find uh a quick little download tell you about content and and kind of how it functions in your business uh or digitalmarket.com of course uh all the certifications on there we are planning on, on updating a lot more certs we have 12 right now we updated three last year uh, but we're going to try to do between four and six next year so subscribe and we'll keep you in tune with when all of those new pieces are out Awesome. Well, thanks so much again. And um, everybody go out there and make some good content and enjoy the rest of your day. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to the Creative Visionaries podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe, leave us a review or share with a friend. Also make sure to visit us online at creativevisionariespodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. And stay tuned for more episodes to come. And remember, it's time to tap into your true potential and unleash your inner visionary.